In day two of this region module, we talked about the problems of globalization and how globalization and neoliberal economic policy produced a lot of negative impacts around the world. Well, in this particular uh, look at solutions, we're going to talk about some alternatives to the problems that are created by sort of a broad global capitalist system, if you will. Now, what I'm doing in this particular solutions section is not really talking about projects per se, as we've talked about other times, but talking about sort of new approaches to solving problems through new, I guess you could call them different kinds of economic systems. The first of these is what's called fair trade. Fair trade advocates argue that the global economic system is inherently unfair, much as we began to talk about when we were looking at the problems of globalization and neoliberal economic policies in the last day. These advocates argue that the system is really rigged to the advantage of people living in wealthy countries, especially those with really good governance in them. And that whole race to the bottom that, again, we briefly talked about impacts the life of the poor, who really have no viable alternative than to work in really poor pain and often very dangerous jobs, in part because that's what the global economic system is giving them, and because the countries in which they live are economically underdeveloped and have really little ability to regulate the way that industries take advantage of the poor labor found in those countries. So advocates of fair trade argue that fair trade is an alternative to this model. It's a broad movement, not just one project or one organization, that tries to create what I've called alternative business modes that are trying to value social justice for producers over the low-cost consumer-driven model, which globalization really gives us. In globalization, everything is about keeping costs low, with very little respect for what's happening to the people who are engaged in the work that are producing low-cost goods. So what fair trade tries to do is it tries to develop new opportunities for people who are producing goods that are consumed all around the world that are economically fair, socially just, they build strong communities, they don't damage the environment, and they also try to respect local traditions and cultures, which goes again to some of those negative aspects of globalization that often lead to languages being lost or cultures being decimated, that sort of thing. Now, the way that this is done is that there are a large number of organizations out there internationally that certify the, the goods that are produced by um, different companies as being fair trade. And they do this as outside partners. Um, so what happens is an organization like Fair Trade USA, and that's the one that I'm going to have you do a little bit of research on, um, can be approached by some business that wants to have its goods marketed as fair trade goods. And then what fair trade goes and does is they certify the work that is taking place and how that work is um, playing out. And then they have a set of criteria that they measure to determine if, whether or not those goods are in fact being produced in a fair way that is creating social justice and all this other stuff that we've talked about as well. And there are lots of organizations that do this. There are many American organizations and international organizations, all of whom are engaged in the certification process. Fair Trade USA is one of the biggest ones in the United States, but there are also organizations that certify coffee as being protective of the rainforest or certify goods that are produced as free of child labor or that certify other types of agricultural goods as being fair trade. Now, there's not a huge variety in fair trade goods. There's no way to buy a fair trade iPhone, for example, right now. But you can get fair trade clothes and fabric. Um, some food items are fair trade. And there are lots of beverages, particularly tea and coffee, that you can purchase as fair trade. So this is one solution that's sort of an alternative model to the problems produced by neoliberalization and globalization. Another problem 
which is a not really quite so focused on the problems of neoliberal economic policy, but is more really about the the broad problems of how economics play out in developing countries around the world, is something called microfinance. Um, what microfinance attempts to do is to bring financial products to the very poor. Now, what are financial products, you might ask? They're things like loans or savings accounts, financial accounts or credits, or even insurance policy that the poor are unable to get in very developing parts of the world. And the reason for this is, number one, that in the developing world, these products are not nearly as easy to access as they are in our country. But number two, when someone is very poor, they have no savings, they have no collateral for loans, it's un they're unable to get loans um, or other sort of financial instruments, in part because the fees and costs associated with opening a new loan account or opening a new uh, account are so high that there's no way a bank could ever make money doing this. In addition to this, many people have to end up going to sort of the informal sector of the economy, loan sharks, um, places that charge exceedingly high interest rates that are really to the disadvantage of the poor. So the idea behind your microfinance is to try to get these sorts of things that are necessary for the growth of the economy available to everyone. And of course, no one would argue that having things like a savings account or the ability to have a small business loan or to have a credit card or an insurance policy, all these things are really crucial to helping economic systems grow. So there are all sorts of organizations that do this. Now, the major instruments that are used in microfinance are micro loans. These are small scale loans that are given to individuals or to groups, especially groups of women who otherwise would have no access to capital in the developing world. Generally, what these organizations do is they provide these loans at what we would consider to be relatively high interest rates, oftentimes much higher than a credit card rate in the developed world, as a way to offset some of the costs of the lending organization. But at the same time, there's usually some sort of international aid as well that helps these loans to be provided for people. These small loans are paid back relatively quickly compared to some of the loans that we're more familiar with, things like mortgages or even long-term loans for automobiles and things like that. Sometimes these things are repaid in a few months or maybe a year or two. But what they do is they give people the opportunity to let their business grow or to start a new business or to do things that they otherwise would not be able to do. Microfinance also dips into other different types of practices. Um, helping the very poor to open savings accounts is something that's very important. Of course, most people in the developing world need to stash their money, literally stash their money, which is unsafe and of course doesn't lead to um, interest being earned and can often be too easily dipped into when the family is in crisis, as well as other products as well. And I've put up here some of the really important microfinance organizations out there. Grameen Bank is the organization that's really credited with starting microfinance in a big way and actually earned the Nobel Peace Prize for its work. Another organization based in um, Bangladesh, but now working around the world, is called BRAC. And Kiva is an American organization that's gotten a lot of press that we will explore a little bit more in this course. Um, these are all organizations that are pretty big, but there are really dozens and dozens of other organizations, especially within individual countries, that help to provide loans for the very poor. Now, microfinance has been shown by many empirical studies to really have um, a lot of benefits for people. They help economies to grow. They help with food security. They help with basic income and education as well. But it's important to note that microfinance is applied in many different ways in many different parts of the world. And not all of the programs have demonstrated really great um, benefits to the people who've received them. Um, some of the programs don't show lasting benefits. 
Um, some of the group loans that are given around the world turn out to be relatively impractical and sometimes only provide benefit to several of the people that are part of the groups. And the problem of interest rates being relatively high for these small loans has been criticized by a lot of people who've looked at microfinance. But all told, both microfinance and also fair trade are new ways to be thinking about economic systems and how to help the very poor around the world um, to become more wealthy and to get better food security and to raise themselves up in ways that I think we would all agree are extremely important.